I have to say, as much as it's a real privilege to be back and to speak, I was a little surprised because I felt worried that I hadn't got enough life experience and things to tell you which would be inspiring or interesting, as I haven't been involved in charity for that long. But I've racked my brains, and here are my thoughts. If I was to wind the clock back five years, I would be 17. And the last thing that I thought I'd be doing now would be directing a charity that I started. I was far more interested in playing computer games or doing martial arts and just not interested in you know, helping people or talking about feelings too much. And that all changed, obviously. And I'll tell you why. But I'd like to tell you a bit about Student Heart Health and what we do first. Student Heart Health is a charity which exists to improve the cardiovascular health of our generation. This is important because even in 2012, heart disease is still the biggest killer and cause of disability in the UK. And not everybody knows that during your teens and university years, we're imprinting our heart health for later in our life. So how does student heart health achieve this objective? It's a couple of things. First of all, we raise awareness about why heart health in general is important. And we raise awareness in particular about risk factors that affect students, mainly sudden adult death syndrome. The sudden adult death syndrome kills around 12 under 25 year olds who are otherwise fit and healthy every week in the UK. It's caused by a structural abnormality in the heart that can be detected in one simple screening, and 90% of the deaths could be prevented. We also try and make living a heart-healthy life more fun, easier, and cheaper for students. And we're planning to conduct some medical research into finding out what the leading risk factors are. I don't often talk that openly about why I started Student Heart Health. And that's mainly because it's quite sad and it's not nice to meet people and make them feel sad straight away. But one of my favourite things about TED Talks when I watch them on YouTube, and I do a lot, is that the speakers are always so open and trust their audience with their motivations for why it is they do what they do. So I'll tell you. Um, five years ago, my wonderful, um, very stylish and cool and kind stepfather, who was otherwise very healthy, died suddenly of a heart attack from a condition he never knew that he had. And I was there when it happened, and I didn't know much about CPR, and I really blamed myself for not being able to help more, and got stuck in this spiral of guilt, inaction, and excuses. And this only got worse when the next year, two young people who I knew died unexpectedly of undiagnosed heart conditions. And I just couldn't believe that these conditions affected so many people, and the awareness of them was so low. I remember being filled with this urgency that more people in the risk group, which is 16 to 25 year olds, know that these conditions exist and could access screenings for free if they wanted them, so they could protect themselves. So I started learning more about heart conditions, which, as a history student, um, studying medieval monks at the time was slightly out of my comfort zone. I met with cardiovascular surgeons and asked them questions about heart disease, and I found out that it was an issue much bigger than just sudden adult death syndrome and that cardiovascular disease was falling in every demographic apart from 16 to 25 year olds. So I was getting this inkling that it was going to be a bigger project than I first thought. So I started to advertise for volunteers, get a team together, begin to do some fundraising, and I realized that we needed to become a charity. So I looked into the legal documentation and got the process started, and that's how Student Heart Health began. Even though, just saying it like that, I think I've made it sound quite straightforward. Um, 
and it was really quite an arduous process to start a charity. But we all persevered, and we've been official for just over one year now. And I'd like to share with you some of my favorite things we've achieved in this year. So first of all, we led a public awareness campaign for sudden adult death syndrome. And we got coverage for the issue on BBC radio, newspapers, online student blogs, and having that kind of exposure allowed us to reach really big organizations like the PGA Tour of America at the University of Warwick, Wick and Wanderers Football Club, uh, designers like The Little Wardrobe, and so on. We raised, as you said, over 10,000 pounds, and most of this money went to our screenings that we put on, our first free screenings, right here at the university, just, just down the road that way um, in social sciences. And it's the beginning of a legacy here at Warwick, and one which I hope to roll out to other universities. We're lucky enough at the charity to have as one of our trustees a leading cardiovascular surgeon and head of the World Health Organization Center for Nutrition on board. And he and I have put together a four-step plan to a healthy heart. Those four steps are activity, nutrition, knowing your risk, and positive lifestyle. We promote the plan on our website and provide practical advice for how you can live that way. And our website, Twitter, and Facebook, if you haven't liked us already, then please do. <laughs> obligated to say that as director. Um, are a place where students can interact with experts on nutrition, on physiotherapy, on heart disease, all for free. And they can access a virtual gym where there are live exercise classes that you can take part into. Um, so it's a really important part of our platform. Um, we managed to recruit over 65 volunteers last year, many from the University of Warwick, which I think is great. I mean, we do have a really socially active campus, clearly, and that's something to be proud of. And the volunteers have been instrumental, and they've done things like design media campaigns for us, design our t-shirts, posters, and our wristbands like I'm wearing. And we've used those to promote our charity and our cause at events like boxing tournaments, Zumba classes, and speeches at schools. At the moment, I'm focused on developing a six-week program for teenagers that integrates these four steps to a healthy heart to try and establish a long-lasting consideration for heart health as early in life as possible. So we've had a lot of success, I think, based on our goals in our first year. And being able to talk to families that have been affected by heart conditions and see the relief on people's faces when they're screened and they know they're okay, it's just been a wonderful experience. But it's made me puzzled as to why it took so much personal grief to inspire me into social action. And I've thought about this and seem to have noticed that sometimes it's crisis that proves to us what stamina we have, or it's sadness of our own which allows us to show compassion to our friends or our family, especially if we're British, like me, um, and allow us to empathize with strangers. And often fear, scary as it is, has that ability to remind us of what or who is most important to us in the world. So if I could tell you something today, I would say, don't do what I did and wait for a personal experience to motivate you into social action and volunteering. And there's a couple of reasons for this, because I've learned that volunteering <coughs> is not just good for you, and it's, it's good for society, but it has some interesting benefits too. Scientists have shown time and time again that there's such a strong correlation between volunteerism, so donating to charity or giving more time and energy, and better immunity, longer lives, and happier people. And quite recently, some neuroscientists did magnetic resonance imaging tests when they look at which brain pathways are stimulated. 
And the pathway which is stimulated when we volunteer is the same one which is stimulated in response to food and dating. Now this shows us that it's a primal part of who we are as human beings. And everywhere we look in culture, even the religions, and it's the first of Buddhism's ten perfections of right living, this idea of being generous with your time with others, and it's the highest of the Christian theological virtues. And there's an entire pillar of Islam as a cat dedicated towards compulsory giving. But if science or religion don't float your boat, then maybe the fact that charity and altruism is social glue will. The principle that a good society is one which practices a concern for the welfare of others is one which runs right from Aristotle to the theory that underpins our modern welfare state. So I'd like everybody just to imagine if we all spent a few more hours every week devoted to a cause that we love, we would be a stronger, a happier, and a healthier society. Often when people think about charity, our minds go to donations to really big foundations. But I've learned that philanthropy is about so much more than money. It's the volunteers and the supporters that vitalize causes. It's volunteers and not funds that are indispensable to making a difference. And it's particularly important that students volunteer because not only do we have the time, the energy, and the talent to devote to a cause that we love, but students understand technology. And technology is changing the way that charity is done. Already, we can donate on our smart smartphones to a charity just as quickly as we can buy a song on iTunes. And there's a new app that's come out which uses GPS and preferences um, about your interest in charity to generate a volunteering opportunity tailored especially for you. Social media has the power to leverage small charities and local causes like never before. So if you have a few hours to spare on a weekend and there's a cause that you care about, your contribution can become more meaningful than ever. The process of starting Student Heart Health has taught me that charity has a transformative power. It allowed me to take an empowering meaning from circumstances that I was finding really difficult to deal with in my life. It's a really old adage that everybody's heard that charity begins at home and it's a bit overused and I think has lost its sparkle. But Home has more than one meaning. It's not just where we live, but it's also the dwelling place of our affections and what's most important to us in the world. So whether it is a local cause in your <coughs> community that's close to your literal home, or just a personal experience which you carry with you, let that be your starting point to making a difference. Thank you.